Well, we begin with the worst diplomatic spat between Russia and Israel since Russia invaded Ukraine. The Foreign Minister, Sergei Lavrov, has accused Israel of supporting neo-Nazis in Ukraine, a day after stating that Adolf Hitler had Jewish origins. It marks a sharp departure from Israel's previous attempts to mediate in the conflict. Alec Pollard has the story. The diplomatic spat between Israel and Russia continues to deteriorate as Moscow doubles down on the controversial comments made by Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov on Sunday when he claimed that, quote, even Hitler had Jewish blood, drawing sharp condemnations from Israel, especially Foreign Minister Yair Lapid. Lavrov's comment is unforgivable. Hitler wasn't of a Jewish descent and the Jews didn't kill themselves in the Holocaust. We are doing everything we can to maintain a good relationship with Russia. But there's a line, and this time this line was crossed. Russia's foreign ministry responding with this rebuke Tuesday, tweeting, We paid attention to the anti-historical statements of the head of the Israeli foreign ministry, Yair Lapid, which largely explained the course of the current Israeli government supporting the neo-Nazi regime in Ukraine. Attached to the tweet, an 800-word document attempting to justify Russia's position, mainly that Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky's Jewishness does not contradict Russia's stated goal of denazifying Ukraine. The statement says that, quote, while Jews were forced to collaborate with Nazis during the war, Volodymyr Zelensky does this consciously and voluntarily, hiding behind his Jewish identity to support neo-Nazis, spiritual and blood hairs of the executioners of his people. Russia gives examples of anti-Semitic incidents in Ukraine and claims that the number of such incidents in the country are more than those of all the former Soviet Union countries combined. These explanations will surely not be accepted by Israeli officials, as Israeli-Russian ties, which have gotten progressively worse as the war has gone on, continue to deteriorate. Well, to talk more about all of that, we're joined from Moscow by Ivan Nechiparenko, Moscow reporter for the New York Times. Good evening to you. Thank you for being with us. And here in the studio, right. our senior affairs editor, Owen Alterman, is uh, with me as well. So, um, Ivan, I'll start with you, um, if I can. Um, what do you think is behind these completely outrageous and bizarre statements by the Russian foreign minister? Well, I, I definitely wouldn't say that this was uh, pre-planned. Uh, I think, uh, you know, Lavrov basically made a very big mistake. He just said something really very stupid. And uh, in a very, uh, you know, in the fashion of uh, how the Kremlin uh, conducts things these days, they just double down on whatever they do, even if it clearly was a mistake. So instead of apologizing, instead of kind of rolling back or saying that uh, he was misunderstood, or the question, or his quotes were put out of context. Instead of that, they doubled down. They issued another statement. They basically said that they they are doing that. And of course, for the Kremlin, uh, which is increasingly isolated uh, at the time of war, at the critical time for Mr. Vladimir Putin's regime, uh, having a good relationship with Israel is of paramount uh, importance. And uh, I think it's very sad that they risk that. So Sergei Lavrov, in a hole, uh, so to speak, and has decided to keep on digging. And um, Owen, um, Israel's Prime Minister, Naftali Bennett, has until now kind of held back from criticising Russia directly, particularly from criticising any um, Russian officials. Um, this appears to have changed that. Why are Lavrov's words about what happened decades ago more important than the, the atrocities Russia is carrying out in Ukraine? This is a red line, and this is a red line that touches Israel directly, Laura. Obviously, the atrocities are the atrocities. Everyone sees them on their screens. Everyone everywhere in the world sees them uh, on their screens. But this is an attack, if you will, even if it was not a premeditated attack. As Ivan Dichaparenko just said, it was nonetheless an attack on Jewish honor, on Holocaust memory. And Holocaust memory is important to Israelis of all political stripes. And I think it was abundantly clear and immediately clear to everyone that this demanded a response. And it certainly got one, first from the foreign minister, Yair Lapid, for whom Holocaust memory is particularly important given his own family history, his father having escaped the Holocaust in Budapest and who has made this a calling card of his time as foreign minister and also Naftali Bennett. I do also think though if you look at the geopolitics and Israel's diplomatic positioning here as we've been saying since the beginning of the war it's a very delicate dance for Israel and so forth but in Israel as in the rest of the world the more the Ukrainians have success the more they win the more the Russians fail the more the Russians lose the more of an incentive there is and the more space there is to take Ukraine's side. And I think that's certainly at play here as well. Maybe had this happened in the first week of the war, 
when the situation was different and the potential scenarios were different, maybe the Israeli response is different, and maybe now that we're two months into this war, that we see it going in a certain direction, maybe the Israeli government, albeit still cautiously, feels a little bit freer to go out and make a statement like this, and maybe in a way it even helps Israel's position internationally by being able to do this when it's obvious to everybody that Israel's on solid ground. Well, Ivan, um, another way of looking at it is that Russia's created a whole kind of distraction uh, right here. Uh, everybody's talking about this rather than looking at what is going on in Mariupol, for example. Um, do you think that there was any, um, any idea of that might happening behind it? The thing is that uh, even if it is a distraction, it's a very unfortunate distraction for Russia. It's not a positive distraction for Russia. Uh, you know, uh, Russia has always been very keen to keep good relations with countries that it would regard as intermediaries with the West, like Israel uh, or like Turkey, for instance. And uh, uh, this puts Russia in a very weak position uh, because Russia loses one of the potential intermediaries in this conflict, one of the countries that were actually willing to stay on kind of a neutral course uh, with Russia. So I, I, I would never expect that this was pre-planned as a distraction. And of course, uh, the war is continuing. And uh, uh, as uh, my colleague has said, that uh, Russia is still uh, not suffering setbacks, or at least not uh, 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 presenting any kind of real achievements, any breakthroughs uh, on the battlefield. So um, we, we're going to continue getting this news. And uh, this, what is happening now with Israel, uh, is, is still is, is big news today, but it's going to fade away. So uh, I don't see it as something pre-calculated in that regard. And Owen, um, it seems like a very long time ago that we were talking about Israel as a potential mediator in this conflict, about talks possibly taking place in Jerusalem. Do you think that's all out of the window now? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. There may be a way back. This is a long war. As we all know, it will take many twists and turns. And Israel, I think, will want to preserve that space with Russia, despite all of the obvious problems. And despite this very, very troubling episode, Israel will still want to preserve that space with Russia because the basic reason for that, the situation in Syria and Russia's leverage over Israel and Syria and the importance of the Syrian arena to Israel, that hasn't changed. One comment on Russia, obviously I'm sitting here, as you are, Laura, thousands of miles away, but it's been widely reported, at least in Israel, that it is a kind of personal investigation into the reasons for the failure of the Soviet Union. Vladimir Putin pointed to the Soviet anti-Semitism as one of the culprits, basically saying that the anti-Semitism of the Soviet Union wasn't rational and that it caused a lot of harm without any obvious benefit. An episode like this would seem to simply prove his point, not that there weren't other reasons for the fall of the Soviet Union, but at least that part of Vladimir Putin's theory, this would seem to, to prove it true. All right, and um, Ivan, just briefly, I mean, um, everybody is talking about how ridiculous these, these comments are here in Israel, but what about in, Ru in Russia? Uh, do people believe what Sergei Lavrov says? Well, the thing is that, uh, you know, people, many people in Russia have shielded themselves away from news because uh, basically all news in Russia are state-run propaganda. So, um, uh, you know, if you ask people on the streets, of course, they don't believe that. But uh, uh, if you watch the news, then you're going to see them twisting it in some kind of favorable way for Mr. Lavrov. But at the same time, we have to remember that Lavrov is not the decision maker in Russia. And the decision maker, there's only one decision maker in Russia. And uh, Putin has been very keen to preserve a good relationship with Israel and with the Jewish people uh, and with the Jewish culture. So I, I think uh, Putin will try to mitigate that maybe behind the scenes something will happen that will mitigate this uh, disaster. Uh